There's a wisdom that is natural, that is earthly, and that is demonic. To put it another way, when James says earthly, he's saying that the wisdom is worldly. When he's saying it's natural, he's saying that it's fleshly. When he's saying that it's demonic, he's saying it's of the devil. There is a wisdom that is worldly, fleshly, and of the devil. And so James has taken the time to give us the signs of this kind of wisdom. When there's bitter jealousy, when there's selfish ambition in the heart, that's a sign that you have the wrong kind of wisdom. He's told us about the character of this wisdom. It's not from above, but instead it's earthly, it's natural, it's demonic, it's of the world, the flesh and the devil, the three great enemies in the Christian's life. But James, as he concludes a description of this wisdom, talks about the fruit of hellish wisdom, how it shows itself. He says in verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition, there's those two terms again, jealousy, selfish ambition. He mentioned those back in verse 14. He says when that's in the heart, he's saying now, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, I guarantee you there is disorder in every evil thing. So you want to know what the fruit of hellish wisdom is? Disorder. The word is unstable, confusion, disorder. And that's why many times when you look at hellish wisdom being manifested in the local church in the lives of God's people, you'll see divisions and cliques and conflicts going on in the church. That's the fruit of a wisdom that is from hell. It produces disorder, instability, conflict, confusion. And James says not only that, but the other fruit that he mentions is every evil thing. He's saying hellish wisdom is responsible for producing every evil thing, every worthless thing, every sinful thing. You, you want to know where it comes from, what produces it? James says it is wisdom that comes from hell. When, when people do evil deeds, when people are involved in evil practices, however you look at it, it is never because they possess wisdom from God. God's wisdom does not produce that. Wisdom from hell does. So when we look at our lives and we see sinful deeds, worthless thoughts, evil desires, so to speak, disorder, it's because we are possessing a wisdom from hell. And if you want there to be havoc in Fairview, if you want there to be havoc in your marriage relationship, in your relationship with other people, then this kind of wisdom will do it. This kind of wisdom, hellish wisdom, will destroy a marriage. It will destroy a relationship. It will destroy a church. Thank God there is a, another kind of wisdom. In James's mind, there's only two types of wisdom. Uh, he, he's not waffling here. Either there's hellish wisdom or there's heavenly wisdom. There's either a wisdom that comes from below and the evidence of it is how we live. 
or there's a wisdom that comes from above. And so in verses 17 and 18, James ends this passage talking about heavenly wisdom. He describes it for us. And the first thing that he tells us about this heavenly wisdom kind of gives us the nature of it when it comes to this heavenly wisdom. He says when, in verse 17, but the wisdom from above. He doesn't actually say the wisdom from God, but he's saying the wisdom from above, the wisdom from God, the wisdom from heaven. There is a wisdom from below, but there's also a wisdom from God. There's a wisdom from heaven. And that's what James is focusing on now. He's presenting two types of wisdom to us. And he's saying, choose which wisdom you will possess. And he says, if you possess a hellish wisdom, you're going to be living a life that dishonors God. But if you possess a heavenly wisdom, then you will be spiritually mature and complete and lacking in nothing. And so then he goes into the character in the description, so to speak, and the characteristics of this heavenly wisdom. He says the first thing about it, it's pure. Nothing dirty, nothing unclean, nothing defiled about wisdom from above. It is morally pure. It is morally clean. It's absent of any sinful attitudes or motives. The wisdom that God gives is pure. And it will be marked by purity in our life. But here is a wisdom that is clean. Here's a wisdom that is not dirty or soiled at all. And that's the first thing that James wants us to know about this wisdom, that it's pure, but he doesn't stop there. He, he gives us a list. He says not only is it pure, but it's peaceable. It's a wisdom that produces peace. And, and you might not remember a lot that I say today, but genuine wisdom, pure, unadulterated wisdom that comes from above will show itself in peace with others. If your wisdom that you quote are getting from God manifests itself in bad relationships where you can't get along, where you're not at peace with your brother and sister in Christ, that's not a wisdom from heaven. Now, and now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the other person will be at peace with you. But I am saying that when you have wisdom from God. It will result in you being a peacemaker, where you will do all that you can to keep peace with your brother and sister in Christ. If your actions are producing conflicts and difficulties and strained relationships, something is wrong. That's saying something about the wisdom that you possess. James is saying that this wisdom Literally, it's peacemaking. And you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the peacemakers. That's a wonderful group of people whose goal in life is to make peace between brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and I've been in the church a long time. And I'm thankful when there are peacemakers in the church. When there are people who are seeking to maintain peace in relationships, in the body of Christ. Wisdom from above manifests itself in that way. James goes on to say that it's gentle. Now, this is a different word than the one gentleness in verse 13 when he talks about deeds in gentleness. This word gentle literally means to be forbearing. It's the idea that you can put up with others. It's that you're considerate, that you're kindly, that you're courteous, that you're reasonable. People mistreat you. Can't take your ball and run home. 
find another church. But instead, if you have peace from God, it's gentle. It allows you to put up with difficult people. And again, though, it's easy to just talk about this kind of broadly in the church. But some of you are married. And so if you have wisdom from God in your marriage relationship, you will be gentle. If you're a man filled with God's spirit, filled with the word of God, then that will show itself. It will manifest itself in forbearing, putting up with hard and difficult situations. Being a person who doesn't get angry, combative or defensive. Every time somebody says something a little bit different from you, what you want to do? Let's fight. <laughs> and we don't do that literally, but, but by the way that we respond, it's all over us. That we, no, we're combative. No, we think somebody's attacking us. But we need to have wisdom from above, and wisdom from above will manifest itself in forbearance. James goes on to say, not only peaceable and gentle, but reasonable. And here it's obedient, compliant, submitting. Not just wives to husbands, but husbands to wives and people to people. Congregation to pastor, pastor to congregation. The, the idea of reasonable. Now, we can't act the opposite. We can't be unreasonable. We all understand what that is, right? Now, we've dealt with people and we say, whoa, that person is just unreasonable. Meaning they're not willing to comply. They're not willing to submit. They're not willing to obey. They're not willing to get along. And all you can say is that when that is true, it's not wisdom from above. The wisdom from above is full of mercy and good fruits. Compassion marks the person who has wisdom from above. Compassion and care and concern, not willing to ignore the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Full of good fruits. Something's coming out of this wisdom. Fruit that is good. And James goes on to say unwavering and without hypocrisy. My friends, these are terms, these are words that should describe you and me if we have wisdom from above. It should be able to say that Paul is pure, that Paul is peaceable, he's a peacemaker, that Paul is gentle, forbearing, he's reasonable, He's full of mercy and good fruits. He's unwavering. He, he sticks and stands for the truth. He's without hypocrisy. He doesn't put on the mask on Sunday. And then as soon as he leaves the door, he removes the mask and you see the real person. Wisdom that comes from God Wisdom that comes from heaven. This is how it shows itself. These are the characteristics of, of real, true, godly wisdom. And James ends in verse 18 talking about the fruit of heavenly wisdom. And he does something that he's done throughout this book. He gives a proverb. And anytime a proverb is given, you don't try to make it walk on all fours. You don't try to get squeeze something out of every word and every phrase. A, a proverb is designed to present a key truth. And you grab that truth and you keep hold of it. And so when James says in verse 18, and, and it doesn't know, it seems like, where does this come from? He says, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. 
Now, I don't know about you, just reading that on the surface sounds like some nice words, but I have no idea what you're saying, James. Uh, the, the, the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James is talking about fruit, what comes from true wisdom. And what comes from true wisdom? The fruit that James identifies here is righteousness. Righteousness. If I possess wisdom from God, if I possess wisdom from heaven, it will show itself in a righteous life. But that's not all that James says. James wants us to understand that righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Want to know where righteousness flourishes, where it grows? You know, certain plants won't grow in certain kinds of soils in certain locations. James says, you want to know where righteousness grows, where it blossoms? It blossoms in the soil of peace. Peace. Remember what wisdom does, what it's characterized by? It's characterized by peace. And, and this righteousness that blossoms, that grows in the soil of peace is actually sown and planted by who? Peace makers. Peace makers. And so as James talks about the fruit of heavenly wisdom, his point is that it is connected to righteousness and peace. Again, we can say all that we want to say, but if our lives are chaotic, if our lives are producing every bad thing, if our lives don't testify to that which is peaceable and peaceful, then James says you can rest assured that your wisdom doesn't come from heaven. Show me your wisdom. Now, I didn't ask you to raise your hand. I didn't ask you to say a word. James is asking you to show him deeds. Deeds that come from good behavior. Deeds that are rooted in humility and gentleness. He wants us to realize that as we seek to live life for God, there are two types of wisdom. There's a hellish wisdom and there's a heavenly wisdom.